Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we initiate our third of five programs on whistleblowers. We have been discussing this extraordinary uh, phenomenon, actually, of uh, people deeply embedded in either a government or a corporation that is doing uh, all kinds of bad things. Uh, but is uh, able to do it uh, covertly. And then occasionally there's a closet patriot that emerges uh, who as a person of real integrity that challenges this from the inside. And that is uh, what we are contemplating uh, this week. Yesterday, we looked at what's going on in China. And uh, today we want to uh, talk about uh, whistleblowers in the UFO uh, movement over the last 75 years. Uh, and uh, we also want to uh, take note of uh, Daniel Ellsberg. And so we'll be talking uh, with uh, Danny Sheehan uh, in a moment, uh, who is uh, uh, going to join us. I want to just begin uh, by saying, though, that I found out something very interesting about the building that uh, I'm sitting in right now is the office of the new Paradigm uh, Institute uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, which is uh, inside the federal enclave, uh, the federal buildings between the Lincoln Memorial uh, and the Capitol building uh, with the Washington Monument in the middle and the White House and the Supreme Court and the Senate and House office buildings and the Smithsonian Museums and and so forth and so on. Turns out that uh, this building, uh, which right now is literally across the street from the U.S. Capitol, was originally the actual site of the first Capitol building of the United States, built uh, after the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, if you remember in 1976, the United States went to war against the British uh, and then uh, gained independence uh, by uh, 1783. By 1789, the Constitution was passed and they, they built a little Capitol building uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, then the British and the Americans went to war in 1812. And if you remember your history, the British came down and burned burned down Washington and burned down the Capitol building. Uh, so this building uh, was burnt uh, by the British during the war. Uh, and then it was uh, vacant for uh, many years. And then it was rebuilt. And during the Civil War, uh, uh, the building on this site was used as a prison for uh, Confederate soldiers that had been captured by the Union Army in the course of the conflict between 1861 and 1865. And then it was uh, derelict for many years. And then uh, it was uh, bought uh, by the United Methodist Church uh, about 100 years ago, uh, largely because they were active against prohibition uh, and the sale of liquor uh, in the United States during the 1920s, and they built this building, uh, which is now called the United Methodist Building, uh, and it's open for many uh, religious denominations like the United uh, Church of Christ or the National Council of Churches or the World Council of Churches, and the uh, uh, New Paradigm Institute is uh, in uh, Suite 405 on the fourth floor. Uh, so I just thought people would be interested in a little bit of, of history uh, as we uh, unfold here. And uh, Georg, I don't know whether uh, Danny has joined uh, or not. Uh, he's been traveling. 
And uh, so uh, I'll continue here um, uh, to uh, provide uh, introductory uh, comments uh, uh, while we're waiting for uh, Danny to join. And we wanted to start uh, today with a narrative by uh, Danny, who was very intimately involved back in the 1960s uh, with the case of Daniel Ellsberg, who I think was really uh, one of the original uh, whistleblowers uh, in the uh, uh, higher reaches of the uh, Pentagon. Uh, he was a brilliant uh, analyst and was given a top secret security clearance uh, literally across the board uh, in the Pentagon uh, where he worked and then uh, began to realize that what the, uh, the government was doing was essentially lying to the American people uh, and to the world about the reality of what was actually happening. And he got so uh, concerned about that that he uh, began to um, Xerox back in those days uh, some of the critical uh, classified uh, documents that uh, showed incontrovertibly that in fact, uh, what the US government was saying to uh, the uh, American public uh, was a total deception, uh, including, as I mentioned a few days ago, uh, the uh, uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident in July of uh, 1964, uh, where the United States, in complete violation of international law, had uh, sent the uh, warships uh, inside the uh, territorial waters of uh, North Vietnam intentionally as a provocation, was uh, arming and providing artillery support for the uh, cadres of the South Vietnamese Army that uh, uh, the U.S. was uh, supporting uh, for raids into North Vietnam. And, uh, and I believe it was in July 30th or 31st of 1964, uh, the North Vietnamese uh, launched some artillery shells and uh, damaged uh, a warehouse. Um, uh, and uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the ships and that began uh, the uh, justification on the part of the United States, which lied to the American public and said that it was a massive assault on U.S. Uh, military personnel and uh, warships who were in international waters, uh, completely neutral and not doing anything to provoke anything. So this was an unprovoked invasion. Remember that from Ukraine? Uh, remember that uh, from what's going on in Palestine with, with Hamas. It's always the same rhetoric. It's an unprovoked uh, invasion or an unprovoked attack uh, by a terrorist group. Uh, and uh, that is what uh, Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson, who was then president of the United States, uh, used to justify uh, to the Congress uh, who voted... Uh, uh, almost unanimously, with very, very few exceptions, uh, to provide the next level of military aid to support the democratic forces uh, in Vietnam, to protect democracy and Western civilization uh, against the terrorists uh, coming in uh, from the North uh, who were going to uh, instill communism and take over the known world. Uh, and that generated the uh, Vietnam War. And in the middle of it, um, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, then a young man, knowing that if he was convicted uh, by a court uh, for tre treason, which is what his actions 
uh, really were um, considered. Uh, think of Edward Snowden. Uh, think of other whistleblowers from the military uh, who have uh, gone to the press. Many of them have gone to jail. And in Edward Snowden's uh, case, he had to escape the United States and ended up in Russia, uh, where the Russians gave him uh, asylum. Uh, think of uh, Julian Assange uh, from Australia, uh, who's now languishing near death in a British prison waiting to be extradited to the United States. So it's not always the case that a whistleblower uh, meets success in what it is that uh, they're seeking to achieve. In this case, uh, Daniel Ellsberg sent the Pentagon Papers, as they came to be called, to the New York Times uh, and to the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, they had the uh, good sense and patriotic uh, obligation to begin to publish uh, what they uh, uh, had received. And uh, Daniel P. Sheehan, who was then uh, working for the law firm uh, Cahill uh, Gordon uh, in New York City, um, was assigned the case as a young uh, a lawyer uh, who, uh, in a series of law cases, uh, set the won the case that set the precedent uh, for whistleblowers uh, that, in fact, if someone in the government or in a corporation um, comes to find out uh, and can provide evidence of illegalities, there's a constitutional protection. And that is what uh, was the famous uh, Pentagon Papers case that went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, of the United States. Uh, and in the end, the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, were uh, acquitted. And the and Daniel Ellsberg, uh, obviously, he had to resign from the uh, Pentagon, uh, but he did not go to prison. And so the friendship that he had with uh, Danny Sheehan uh, was steadfast uh, until uh, just a month ago or two, uh, Daniel Ellsberg at the age of uh, 93 uh, succumbed to the passage of time and uh, went um, to uh, the other side and his reward. And if, all, if you remember, uh, Dan Ellsberg was uh, on Humanity Rising uh, in the spring, uh, and he came on to H Humanity Rising the day after he was informed by uh, his doctor that he had pancreatic cancer that was uh, uncurable uh, and that he had about six months to live. And, and watching uh, Dan Ellsberg in those final six months and watching the dignity and the magnanimity uh, with which he uh, spoke, you know, his final will and testament, his concern about nuclear weapons, uh, to which he had dedicated his entire life. And even though he uh, became famous uh, because he was involved in the Pentagon Papers around the Vietnam War. It was actually what he learned in the Pentagon about the extraordinary, devastating power of nuclear weapons and realized that many people, uh, even in the military, to say nothing about the President of the United States or the Congress or the people that were in on the decision-making processes, uh, had really no idea about what nuclear war really means and the devastating consequence of uh, igniting uh, nuclear exchanges uh, in our world. Uh, and you'll remember uh, that uh, uh, it was just a few years previous to D Dan Ellsberg uh, releasing the Pentagon Papers in 1968, that in 1962, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis 
where the United States almost went to thermonuclear war uh, against the Russians uh, over the fact that the Russians had placed in Cuba uh, nuclear uh, weapons. And uh, at the request of Fidel Castro, uh, after the United States had placed nuclear weapons uh, in Germany and the UK and France, uh, and then they uh, placed nuclear weapons right in Turkey, right on the Russian border. So in response to that, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the general secretary of the uh, Communist Party in what was then the Soviet Union, worked out a deal with, with uh, 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 Fidel Castro, who had just, in 1960, overthrown the uh, US-backed regime of Batista, uh, which was basically a mafia regime in Castro that had made a deal with the American, the pineapple companies and the banana companies and the coffee companies, to have Cuba be an export platform for U.S. corporations. Uh, and so uh, the uh, U.S. corporations, once uh, Fidel Castro seized power, he nationalized all of those corporations and said that the pineapples and the bananas and the coffee uh, actually belonged to the Cuban people. And the United States was so uh, incensed uh, that in the late uh, stages of the Eisenhower administration in 1960, they launched uh, plans to uh, invade Cuba and overthrow Fidel Castro. And as you may remember from your history, uh, it, was, uh, it was when John Kennedy became president in January 1961 that in fact uh, the... Uh, invasion, uh, the so-called Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, was launched right when he was becoming president. And it was a complete failure uh, because uh, it turns out that the Cuban people supported Fidel Castro and went to war against the invaders. And it ended up in a complete fiasco. Uh, and uh, in the aftermath of that, then Fidel uh, said to the uh, Russians, we need nuclear weapons in Cuba uh, as a deterrent against the United States. Well, when the United States um, uh, realized in uh, uh, the spring of uh, 1962, uh, the uh, U-2 flights over Cuba, and the satellite, uh, the, the surveillance, that in fact, the Russians were building uh, a nuclear capable missile launching uh, complex. Uh, the US just went apoplectic. And the thought that the Russians would do to the United States, what the United States was doing to the Russians was just unconscionable and a violation of the Monroe Doctrine that had been enunciated by President Monroe in 1823 stating that no foreign power was allowed anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, not in Canada, not in Mexico, not in Central America, not in Latin America, all the way down to uh, Argentina uh, to deploy uh, military troops or have a military alliance, that the entire Western Hemisphere was the domain of US control and uh, a suzerainty. So when uh, the Russians did that in um, 1962, uh, the combined consensus, which is kind of hard to believe now, the combined consensus of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff led by General Curtis LeMay, who was the head of the Air Force, uh, supported by the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State recommended to President Kennedy that they go to a full bore intercontinental ballistic nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. And that attack 
was designed to take out 160 cities across Russia. And the estimates of uh, the Air Force and the Pentagon is that it would leave uh, probably upwards of 60 to 80 million people dead. And when President Kennedy was told this information, he was aghast. And working with his brother, Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General of the United States at that time, the two of them uh, began to uh, engage in secret negotiations, which they kept secret from their own cabinet to try to figure out a peaceful resolution of this crisis. But the momentum toward war, nuclear war, was uh, inexorable. And uh, so at, at a minimum, what Kennedy did, as you remember from your history, is uh, our, uh, 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 order a blockade surrounded Cuba with warships as the, the, the Russians were bringing uh, the final missiles uh, into Cuba uh, and uh, the warships stopped. And one of the things that was happening and the reason why they stopped is that Kennedy had, had sent a, uh, a message uh, to Khrushchev uh, saying there's got to be a way that we can solve this. And in fact, they reached an agreement that if the United States would withdraw troops from Turkey and the nuclear warheads from Turkey, the Russians would withdraw their nuclear weapons and their troops from Cuba. But there was so much pressure to go to war with Russia, nuclear war, that the agreement was that the Russians would withdraw their nuclear weapons from Cuba immediately. And six months later, the Americans, after the crisis had died down, would secretly withdraw their weapons from Turkey. That was the level of pressure against President Kennedy to go to war. And you, you may know uh, that he paid a price for this because the uh, General LeMay in the, in the Pentagon, in the Air Force, and the powers that be in the, in the Air Force, including the powers that be in the CIA, uh, who felt that Kennedy wasn't man enough uh, to uh, go to nuclear war. That was the cabal uh, working with the Cuban mafia groups uh, in uh, in Florida uh, that put together the assassination uh, two years later, uh, one year later, in November 22nd, 1963, uh, in Dallas, Texas, that assassinated the president and then brought in Lyndon Baines Johnson. And one of the first acts that Johnson did as president was move forward uh, in Vietnam uh, with the pretext uh, of the Gulf of Tonkin. And Dan Ellsberg was in the Pentagon privy to all the intelligence information while all this was going on. And uh, that is the backstory of uh, Ellsberg and one of the great uh, whistleblowers uh, uh, of our time. And uh, so we wanted to commemorate that. It looks like uh, uh, Danny is not uh, joining us. I don't know whether there were technical uh, difficulties or, uh, or what we'll have him on at a, a different time. Uh, but I want to now, uh, since- Jim, I, I think people are very curious to hear more about your job in Washington, what you're doing, what you're encountering, yeah, good. I was just going to turn to that. Uh, thank you, Georg. Um, one of the things that Danny also did was 
uh, he became involved uh, in uh, beginning in 1977 with the uh, UFO issue. And uh, he was the general counsel to John Mack, who was the head of psychiatry at uh, Harvard, uh, who was asked by the Pentagon to analyze a number of people who said that they had uh, UFO experiences because the Pentagon was asserting that they were crazy, that they were psychologically deranged in one way or another. And uh, so John Mack called Danny, who by then was uh, you know, quite famous as a litigator who never lost cases, uh, given his extraordinary intelligence that he uh, possesses and his capacity uh, in a courtroom. Um, and uh, Harvard University uh, had a tribunal and they hauled John Mack up and told him that, that uh, it was an embarrassment to Harvard University that, uh, that he was you know, taking on these cases and his assertion as a psychiatrist is that there was nothing wrong with any of the people that he was uh, interviewing and analyzing, that they were very um, uh, sane. And he got involved particularly with those people who uh, asserted that they had experienced abductions. And he wrote a whole book on abductions, uh, John Mack did. Uh, and beginning in that stage also uh, with President Carter, um, who was denied uh, access to the UFO uh, information uh, by the head of the CIA at that time in, in uh, 1977, who was George Bush Sr. Uh, uh, President Carter had seen UFOs uh, while he was a farmer. Uh, you know, he had a peanut farm in, in uh, the state of Georgia, and he'd seen UFOs. So one of the first things he did when he became president, he called the CIA and said, I want all the information on uh, the UFO matter. And the head of the CIA, George Bush Sr., said, no, you don't have a need to know. So uh, uh, President Carter, uh, by executive order, asked the Library of Congress to find uh, start a study on the UFO phenomenon outside the jurisdiction of the CIA. And Danny became involved in this. What led to the present moment is that in 2012, if I remember correctly, um, the uh, Pentagon uh, established an office that was headed by a gentleman named uh, Lou Alessandro, uh, who was a uh, top intelligence official, complete security clearance to uh, find out uh, information uh, on the UFO uh, issue. So uh, as a loyal military uh, man, uh, Lou Alessandro began to uh, look for information. And what he began to discover is that as he requested certain pieces of information, uh, he was being told that he, like the CIA told President Carter, that he didn't have a right to know. Uh, and uh, he became puzzled because he was the guy who was supposed to be in a position to know, and he was being denied information. Uh, he also um, uh, realized that when he would bring a t uh, some evidence that he was able to gain to certain officials uh, in the Pentagon um, uh, and the intelligence community more broadly, uh, they showed no interest in uh, finding out any more about the information. And he began to realize that, wait a minute here, there's something wrong with this picture. Uh, and in particular, you'll remember the, um, the incident uh, in 1967 at the Malms Malmstrom uh, base uh, in uh, Montana, where they had a cluster of 
nuclear missile silos, Minutemen missile silos that carried, you know, hundreds of kilotons of nuclear material. And they were on hair trigger alert uh, to attack the Soviet Union, you know, at a split second notice. And um, uh, the uh, the head of the uh, the group was a lieutenant, uh, Robert Solace, uh, and uh, he has given evidence and tells the story that you know one day uh, he was notified urgently by uh, the people in the silos that uh, they were who had monitors that there were UFOs hovering uh, over the. The, the complex of nuclear weapons and that they thought that the, the they didn't know what they were, but they thought they were close enough to break through the perimeter protecting the nuclear missiles. And uh, so Sala said, well, I don't know what they are. See, see if you can find out what they are, but under no circumstances are you to allow anybody to uh, penetrate the, the perimeter. And then uh, the call came a few minutes later, and the the, the people in the missile silos were were uh, apoplectic, and they were saying, "You've got to do something because they're shutting down the missile silos." And so uh, there was a lot of confusion, and they didn't know what to do. But uh, the the UFOs had had shut down simultaneously ten independently uh, organized uh, nuclear weapons missile silos uh, so that they couldn't work. And then the UFOs flew away. No one uh, compromised the perimeter of the base. Uh, they did it apparently from the UFO and that it, it was an, a shocking experience and uh, Salas had reported it immediately to the Pentagon and to the powers that be. And the Air Force and the Pentagon uh, acted as if nothing had happened and ordered Salas and the uh, various people that were involved in the incident uh, not to say anything um, uh, under any circumstances to anybody what had happened. And when Lou Alessandro began to realize that uh, in an incident that should have alerted the entire national security apparatus of the entire military and the intelligence, but nobody was doing anything. And in fact, they indicated to him that they didn't want to know about it. He said, this is a, a, a compromise of national security. And he became a whistleblower. He decided that he, like Ellsberg in the 1960s, um, he needed to do something to alert somebody that there's something off here. And that's when he called Danny Sheehan and retained Danny as his general counsel. And to make a long story very short, uh, they um, uh, they met uh, with the inspector generals and the head of intelligence uh, for the Pentagon, and uh, they did not receive uh, any satisfaction. So finally, uh, Lou Alessandro resigned. And working with uh, Chris Mellon, who was at, uh, previously the uh, head of intelligence uh, for the Pentagon, they went to the New York Times, just like Ellsberg did. And they uh, turned over videos of uh, military uh, pilots in military aircraft who had taken videos of these unidentified flying objects or what are now being called UAPs, the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, and they gave it to the New York Times and they happened to get uh, some uh, alert uh, investigative uh, reporters. Uh, and I think it was on December uh, 17th, 2017, 
for the first time in history, like the New York Times had done when it broke the news of the Pentagon Papers, the New York Times, and on a front page edition, uh, released information uh, stating categorically that officials inside the U.S. government uh, had incontrovertible evidence of UFOs. And so uh, Lou Alessandro, uh, you know, instantly became, uh, like Ellsberg, uh, uh, an international celebrity and was all over the news and uh, so forth. Uh, and uh, Danny was in and through the entire uh, process. But that instance where the New York Times published the information triggered then uh, what is now taking place uh, in the U.S. Congress uh, today. And the reason why I'm here in Washington uh, because uh, the intelligence community uh, became uh, alerted. The Congress also became alerted to the fact that after 75 years of uh, UFO-related uh, investigations, the Congress didn't know anything. Members of the investigating in the of the executive branch, including the President of the United States, were being kept out of the loop. So the question is, who is in the loop? Who has the information? And why doesn't the US Congress, the government of the United States, have access to information implications of which are cosmological. This isn't just like information about chemical or biological weapons or nuclear weapons or you know what China's doing in the South China Sea, uh, which really don't make that much difference. This is information about the reality that we are being visited by extraterrestrial civilizations from other galaxies. That's an extraordinary piece of information. And the US Congress and most of the US government is completely out of the loop. So what began to happen at its most I would say abstract is one of the three branches of government, which according to the Supreme Court, if you have to choose between the legislative and the judicial and the executive branch, it's the legislative branch of the government, which is, is the government. They began a process of asserting that the information that's out there belongs to the US government and that the US Congress is beginning a series of legislative enactments to, in the first instance, in December of uh, 2022, one year ago, next month, they set up an all domain anomalous uh, resource office, Arrow, that uh, was to be the recipient of all information from, I think, 37 intelligence agencies across the entire federal government, uh, contracting corporations, uh, any other uh, uh, organ of government, that they all had to begin the process of turning over information uh, to the U.S. Congress. It was being organized by the intelligence committees of the Senate and the House, the Government Operations Committee of the Senate uh, and the House. Uh, and it was a completely bipartisan consensus because this wasn't ideological. This was institutional. This was about the U.S. Congress, whether you're an extreme right or you're extreme left, taking um, a position that 
it had the right to know what's going on. And it was that process be initiated by the New York Times report on December 17th, uh, 2017, that led finally to this legislation last year. Then Senator Schumer, the majority leader of the Senate, and Senator Rubio, uh, who is the head of the Intelligence Committee of the Senate, drafted legislation for the next and final step that was embedded in the uh, defense authorization bill uh, uh, as the Arrow Office was uh, in uh, 2022 uh, to establish a nine person committee that would oversee all the information and the disclosure into the public domain. And uh, this is why uh, we're working here in Washington right now. Uh, the, 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 the legislation, which is right now in reconciliation between the Senate and House Armed Services Committees, which are the official sponsors of the Defense Authorization Acts each year, are now um, uh, reconciling the Senate bill, which calls for this nine person uh, committee to be set up nominated by the president. And it happens that our office is involved in actually making recommendations as to who these people should be. Uh, and then the Senate ratifies them. And then they, they, they have what is called a controlled disclosure plan over seven years, commencing on January 1, 2024, through 2030. Uh, for gathering this information. And there's a whole process uh, that uh, uh, is in place if this legislation finally passes uh, so that any information before 1998 has to be sent over and eventually disclosed unless for some reason the president wants to postpone. So the president as final prerogative uh, over this process uh, and the uh, various agencies and the contracting corporations have the right for any evidence since 1998 to be postponed. So that's what's happening, but it's all being done by the right of eminent domain. Again, remembering that the Congress now is trying to assert its right to have this information. And that's the process that we're involved in. Now comes the second whistleblower. On July 26th, several months ago, July 26, 2023, the House Intelligence Committee held hearings. And one of the people, at the hearing was a, a man named David Grush, who was the one that replaced Lou Alessandro in this UAP office in the Pentagon. And like Lou Alessandro, realized that he was not being given the information that the people that should know didn't know, and that there didn't seem to be any concern over issues that uh, would and should trigger acute national security uh, interests. And to give you a measure, just think of the Chinese weather balloons. There you had these balloons from China, you know, way up, you know, uh, uh, thousands of, of feet above the uh, surface of the earth floating across the United States. And there was like this major media frenzy and international crisis until finally they were shot down. But around UFOs, nothing happens. Why? So David Grush, like Lou Alessandro, 
decided to become a whistleblower. And he wrote a letter. He called Danny. Um, and Danny, in the end, was too busy uh, with other things and, and recommended that he take another lawyer. But Danny was involved in it. Um, uh, uh, went to the inspector general of the Pentagon uh, and reported that this is what's happening. And then uh, he gave a very uh, important uh, news interview uh, with Courtright, a, a journalist uh, out of Australia, uh, where he just laid out uh, even more startling uh, information that the US government is in possession, not of one, uh, but a dozen different unidentified flying objects that have been retrieved in different places around the world that come from off planet. They are not human technology. Uh, and that it has in its possession multiple, some assert, scores of alien bodies non-human intelligences that have either been killed in the course of either the crashes like in Roswell in 1947 in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, there's apparently one that, that uh, either was or continues to be alive that they captured and put in captivity. So this is according to David Grush. And if you've looked at the hearing uh, uh, on July 26, which I urge everybody uh, to do, uh, there is uh, um, uh, there were other people in the from the military uh, who stated categorically uh, that there is a multiple uh, uh, occasions uh, in which uh, fighter aircraft pilots have tracked uh, and videoed and, and put on the radar um, uh, craft that have extraordinary capacities to move um, from 80,000 feet up in the air to sea level in less than a second, which can go from air to sea uh, without losing momentum and can travel in the oceans, under the oceans at 300 miles an hour that appear to defy any known laws of gravity or thermodynamics known to human technology and can be going at um, thousands of miles an hour and do a U-turn uh, and can stop, go up, down, uh, and appear to have the capacity to know when a US military personnel are even thinking of pulling the trigger and attacking them because they just disappear. They just disappear and can go uh, into one dimension uh, into another without any apparent problem. And so you have, uh, you have an extraordinary uh, phenomenon going on uh, that the US government uh, has been keeping completely secret in many cases from the government itself, while the group that's controlling this information have been retrieving this, coordinating with major defense contractors uh, like Raytheon, like Grumman, like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, that are the major military contractors of our time to reverse engineer whatever technology that uh, the U.S. government can figure out and use it to enhance U.S. military capacity as it seeks, as we've discussed, uh, to establish uh, what it calls full spectrum dominance over the entire planet, including uh, out in space, 
And that's why there's war against Russia, war against China. Uh, the United States is currently seeking full spectrum dominance. And a key piece of that strategy is to reverse engineer the technology that's been retrieved from the UFOs. Simultaneously, it has had an orchestrated campaign since almost immediately after the Second World War to cover it up, to lie about it, and further to have a orchestrated campaign to trivialize it, to marginalize anybody who reports UFOs and to uh, get them considered crazy. So if you talk to anybody about UFOs, people think, oh yeah, you're just some guy in a trailer park uh, from Arizona somewhere who sees things at night. That's been a carefully cultivated campaign by the CIA for the last 75 years. And in the middle of all that, the evidence of UFOs on earth has gotten so enormous Whistleblowers are now bringing out the information. The Congress is now wanting in on that, that the cat is now out of the bag. That's basically what's happened. And what we're in Washington doing right now is trying to ensure that the bill, the Schumer Amendment, remains essentially intact as the National uh, uh, Defense Authorization Act uh, is uh, finally put together and passed uh, over the next uh, four uh, to six weeks. Uh, and so that, in a nutshell, is what I'm doing here and uh, the general domain that we were hoping uh, to cover uh, today. Uh, and um, so, I haven't been uh, looking at the chats. I can't. I see that there's been lots and lots of um, uh, questions, um, and um, see if I can find some. Or Georg, if you've got uh, some of the salient ones, you can just uh, let me know what they are. Uh, but if there's anything that uh, anybody wants to know, you could put it in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Barbo uh, uh, Estrin daughter is asking about all the other people around the world that claim they have seen UFOs. And are you saying that all other governments are also keeping this a secret? Um, good question. The prevailing consensus uh, of people around the world. Interestingly, if you look at a graph, uh, probably at least 50, 60% of all the UFO sightings have been happening in the United States, triggered by uh, the Trinity test uh, on July 16th, 1945, where we ignited uh, the first nuclear device that then three weeks later we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That really triggered the UFO phenomenon in a modern sense. Um, and then there's been maybe another 20% uh, have been in Europe. There've been a lot in Europe. Uh, and then the rest of the world uh, has about 20% of the sightings, uh, just to give a sense of, of the, the distribution, the global distribution of UFO sightings. And as you know, there's different categories. Uh, category one is when you see it. Category two, close encounters of the second kind, uh, is uh, sort of when they, they land and leave physical uh, evidence. Uh, close encounters of the third kind is when there's some kind of communication uh, back and forth. And close encounters of the fourth kind is when there's some kind of experienced abduction. And then close encounters of the fifth kind 
are what we're interested in is how do humans begin to cultivate a capacity to engage with the ETs? Because it's clear that we can do so. And one of the extraordinary uh, data points on this communication uh, is that overwhelmingly, what the extraterrestrial intelligences are telling us is that we are killing each other, we're killing the planet, and we've really become a virus in the planetary ecology. And we've got to stop, particularly we need to stop the nuclear weapons. Now, I mentioned what happened in 1967 with the uh, Minutemen missile sites in uh, Montana. It's happened in the Soviet Union uh, multiple times. It's happened in other uh, missile silos in the United States multiple times. So there's clearly um, the uh, extraterrestrials, uh, which appear to be sort of observing us uh, somewhat in a fact-finding modality, uh, but they're very concerned and have been communicating to people all over the world um, that we need to get it together as a human race, unite as a single human family, come into synergy with the larger planetary ecology. And only then will we be ready for the kind of contact with the extraterrestrial civilizations that they're waiting for us to have, but we need to go through a maturational um, catalyst of higher consciousness. Uh, and that's what humanity rising is about. That's what the New Paradigm Institute is about. You know, we're, we're wanting to somehow get human beings to stop killing each other en masse in Ukraine, in Gaza, in the Congo, in Tibet, uh, all over the world, you see violence of every conceivable kind. Our species seems incapable of the kind of global cooperation that is so obviously imperative. And so the ETs are basically warning us in one way over the world, repeatedly over the last 75 years uh, to stop the violence and come together in radical collaboration. That's what they're saying. And so um, uh, Oh, I guess that to see that someone's dad was at Maelstrom Air Force Base. Uh, could they come on with you? Absolutely. If you got, if there's someone there that we could uh, uh, bring on that was actually there, that would be an incredible uh, thing to uh, have. Um, uh, but uh, those are uh, just some of the the uh, uh, factors um, that. Um, that are there. So if there's any other uh, questions that uh, anyone have, if not, we'll bring this session to uh, a close. Uh, but we're in a very exciting time and we're developing a training program that we're gonna launch hopefully over the next couple of months uh, between the New Paradigm Institute and Ubiquity University that will have two parts. One, which will be developed by New Paradigm Institute, which will be the history, the politics, the law, what you can do politically to contact your congressional representative, uh, wherever you are around the world, your government agency, uh, to stop keeping this information secret. Uh, because in fact, the US government, uh, uh, wherever these ETs have been cited around the world has immediately gone there. with obviously the exception of Russia or China, 
uh, and has uh, insisted that uh, the other governments keep this completely secret. So it may well be that the Russians and the Chinese are also doing the same thing as the Americans, and that is trying to reverse engineer the technology that they've captured uh, for military purposes. And um, so uh, that's the point. This is, this is this inflection point that we're um, at. Uh, to, so to the question of Charles Bensiger, yes, absolutely. That's the whole point that we need with disclosure. We've got to stop this policy formation of limiting the ET technology just to building more weapons. We've got to release it to public domain because the energy and the technology uh, could give humanity unlimited energy for free, unlimited capacity to travel to other star systems in an instantaneous blink of an eye. All that is possible. The ETs have given us that technology and it's being secreted away by the military industrial complex to, to build better weapons, to kill people. And the ETs are just watching us doing it and are just aghast that we have no capacity for higher consciousness. I mean, uh, Stephen Greer in the, uh, the Disclosure Project has got a beautiful documentary on the uh, technologies that uh, are apparently there through the uh, ET craft and capacities that have released into the public domain would radically liberate humanity to unlimited technology uh, and uh, uh, harmony with uh, galactic and natural uh, uh, systems. We don't need fossil fuels. We don't need to be igniting climate change uh, everywhere around the world, releasing massive amounts of methane into the atmosphere as we are currently doing. But the information needs to get out and that's what we need to to, to do. So we have this training program uh, to talk about the, 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 uh, the technologies that in a concrete political way. And then what ubiquity will bring to this certification program is the spiritual development, the personal development. How do we refine our intuitive and extrasensory perceptions so that we can activate our eighth chakra, which as you know, is above the head and is sort of the antenna for the human being uh, to the, gla the galaxy. We're, we're all work walking around with antennas, except we don't know it. Well, what if we really learned the uh, mechanisms of the chakras and how we can use our chakras uh, and our antenna to engage in mental telepathy with the extraterrestrials? That's possible. People do it all the time. And so we're gathering at Ubiquity the people who know how to do this because we believe Linda that... White is available if you invite her. Oh, okay. Linda, uh, let's get Linda on. And then um, Linda White. I did it, Jim. She's joining us, panelists. Oh, cool. Thank you. So that, and Linda, actually, uh, with a colleague, you you were there, Linda. <laughs> Linda uh, has actually been involved in this issue, and she's one of our faculty uh, on ET trauma. Mm -hmm. And she was on Humanity Rising, as you may re recall, uh, several weeks ago, uh, talking about it. But Linda, I welcome you to make any comment you would like to make on anything that I've said or anything that you would like to add. Well, I tell you, Jim, what's most alive for me is you're making my dissertation totally obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> These are all the threads that I've been weaving together. And, um, you know, I grew up, you know, on Mount Storm Air Force Base, and my dad was a navigator B-52 bombers, and he was a missile launch commander. He was in the same silo as um, Captain Salas, 
you know, a year and a half before we left December of 65 and the event was, you know, March of 67. And then it gets even more mysterious. I mean, for the next three years, I've really, you know, the dissertation is my life story of trying to make sense of things that I couldn't talk about because it was so buried in conspiracy. And so mm -hmm. I had to be really selective as to who I talked to because people would think I was crazy. So it's not just the UFO, you know, it's the whole. Um, and then what I found out in my dissertation research, which I didn't know, I mean, you, you're going to love all the details in my dissertation, I think, because there's so I'm many. Sure. But I didn't realize like when we left Montana, it was with the understanding my father was deploying to Vietnam, but he never went to Vietnam. And then I've learned in the research that I've done that he began his career with the Office of Special Investigations in the beginning and the end. And Richard Doughty, who's very well known as, you know, um, in the UFO community, you know, was with that organization. So what I've been trying to figure out is how this and then my uncle disappeared when I was a child. And in my dissertation research, he surfaced. I mean, talk about timeless wisdom. He surfaced and he had gone dark with the CIA and it gets even more yeah, intriguing. Yeah, yeah. So these, and and um, I really highly recommend this book to anyone who's interested in this topic. I'm in the middle of reading it now. It's called One Nation Under Blackmail and it um, weaves all of these in, but you, you know, everything that you just shared today, um, when Carter became president and Bush wanted to continue with the CIA and Carter said no, and I'm see, this is where my fear, this is my trauma from this. And what I'm you know, writing about is the moral injury of the mm -hmm. 75 year mm -hmm. um, truth embargo, because even now, I mean, I've dedicated my life to this. And even now what I'm going to say, I hesitate, you know, but um, after Carter refused George Bush and the CIA, there was a group, there has been a private CIA that formed. And that I think is really what is the underbelly of a lot of this. And somebody had asked a question, which I just loved in the, they said, what difference is legislation going to make? And I think what, you know, the legislation with these, you know, hidden, and I think what it's going to do is bring all of this out to the surface. But I will yeah. share this one little piece, and this is kind of, I'm giving away the punchline of my dissertation, but what I want to say is the timeless wisdom, you know, when we really, you know, with yes. the consciousness that we're bringing to this, it's all going to come together. And so the example I can give is, I don't know where I got this article, but it is from 1966. It's got the CIA stamp on it in 60, I think it was 72, but it was released. And it was when the Lytton Company Corporation, an aerospace corporation, um, there was concern about them all coming together as a conglomeration. And that was right at the apex of all of this when aerospace, um, all, all, everything started to converge at that time. And that is what you and Danny are going in and starting to unravel. You know, so th that's kind of like the apex of it. And now you're coming in from the outside. But again, it's by bringing awareness. Yeah. And I, the most important thing that I want to say is we have got to stop treating people like they're crazy when they speak their deep inner truth. I don't care what it is. You know, this is why I've been a therapist for 30 totally. years and it's for the prime reason to give people a space to be able to talk about what's on their heart and to believe them, whether or not it makes sense to us, you know, that we really have to just start trusting each other and listening to each other. And um, anyway, obviously this is a passionate topic for me. <laughs> And what you shared today, my goodness, I mean, you know, I'm just like checking the boxes as you went down. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I've spent my life trying to put this together. And, you know, the dissertation is my effort. And what you and Danny are doing, I just, I, I just, I'm just so happy and so thrilled, you know, that this is all coming to the forefront. And I guess the other thing I will say, you know, literally, with David Grouch coming forward. And this is this is just how life works when we're in the flow. I happened to be with Danny and Richard Dolan in California when that broke and we all got to watch mm. it together and hear the conversation. And again, sitting in the audience, here we are all these years later. And what Grouch went through was that my father went through. My father was 37 and Grouch is 37, 38. 
And, you know, so I have a deep, intimate, cellular experience of what his wife went through, what his children were going through. And that's all these years later. And, you know, that's just one example. And then, and, and I will say this too, and this is how in the hub of this I am. I grew up in Anne Arundel County. After we left Mountstrom, we came to Anne Arundel County. That's where NSA is. My father was stationed at NSA. Mm -hmm. And that's where Richard Snowden, he grew up in Anne Arundel County and NSA. So, I mean, for me, I just, it's overwhelming how all these threads are coming together, <laughs> but I'm just thrilled, you know, that um, in my passion for the rest of my life, I mean, I'm at an age to retire, but is to start healing this moral in injury from the individual level and yeah. also collective. And, um, and I'll, I'll just take it one step further and then I'll be quiet because I could go on and on and on. But, you know, we just had a mass shooting in Maine oh, and, yeah. and the mass was a veteran. And while I'm watching that unfold, literally it happened on Wednesday, Monday, we had just been acknowledged as the safest state in the nation. Wednesday, we have the mass shooting. He was a veteran. And then meanwhile, we're mobilizing for two wars and we're sending in ground troops overseas. And I'm just like, talk about schizophrenic. You know, can't anybody see the schizophrenic culture that we live in? You know, that we're, we're panicking. So anyway, like, that's my ramble. <laughs> well, no, I think you're uh, making some seminal points and, I would underscore two things about what you've been saying is, you know, everyone, what Linda lived through with her father and her family is uh, indicative of what hundreds of people have lived through who've either, uh, maybe more, who've uh, either had experiences and everybody who's ever reported a UFO experience has their lives completely changed. It's not something, well, you know, maybe uh, you had something on Saturday, but by next Tuesday, you don't remember. Virtually everybody who has a UFO experience has a life-changing experience. And it's so real to them that it can't be denied. And yet the culture says you're delusional. So the trauma that... Uh, Linda went through and her father went through is significant. And some people don't survive the experience. And we need to just take that in as we're now navigating into this next phase. Um, and then the second point uh, is just really um, the opportunity that's now with us given Lou Alessandro, given David Grush, given the, given the different whistleblowers, given what Congress is doing, there's a momentum. And the extraordinary thing, and this is what I want to tease out, from a Jungian point of view, the perfection of this moment is exquisite. Right at the moment, we're literally about ready to take ourselves out. With climate change, with world war, it's unbelievable where the world is now convulsing with a momentum toward war, right as climate change is spinning out of control. People like the main uh, mass shooter are, are freaking out and we're being notified by the US government essentially that the ETs are here we're not alone, which is providing humanity with the one narrative that if we could embrace it, Jim, would allow would I, us. I could just interrupt with that. So the one comment, though, is that it's our more so than not. I mean, I think with the civilians, the not believing being believed is the issue and the insanity. But from a military and anybody that would report it to the military, it was the threat narrative and the yeah. paranoia that would em emerge out of that. Yeah. And so it really, truly, and again, you know, the Jungian is, and transpersonal is my passion, is that it really boils down to our relationship to power. Yes. And this is where the spiritual comes in, you know, that can we align with a higher intelligence, you know, that comes from within 
and not be so paranoid and fearful of the external intelligences and how we have been conditioned to fear, you know, and also seduced by yeah. how to look away. I've mentioned exactly. before that I talked that addiction is looking away and how we've been conditioned to look away from the truth. And, you know, look at all the shiny objects and, you know, in the, you know, the, the, that were the most powerful nature nation and that, you know, we're the most humanitarian and none of it's true. You know? So breaking through the denial, breaking through the lies, coming exactly. into power. So. Exactly. exactly. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and uh, so I really thank you, uh, Linda. I want to also note uh, uh, Charles's point about volunteers. We've been kind of inundated with people who want to volunteer. We're in the process of organizing them. And um, probably over the next couple of weeks, uh, as we get our director of operations in place and different uh, aspects of our basic organizational infrastructure so that we can handle the volunteers, we'll be in touch with everybody uh, and probably we'll have some meetings uh, because we want to honor everybody who wants to be involved. Uh, and because we see this as a people's movement. It's just that we're 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 needing to get it together uh, at the level of infrastructure in order to be able to uh, honor the uh, enthusiasm that we're uh, meeting uh, from people who want to uh, volunteer. So, well, I think that'll probably take us uh, to the outer limits of today, everyone. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for jumping in. I really appreciate it, and you'll be able to take Linda's course, hopefully starting in the new year uh, uh, from Ubiquity University as part of this larger new paradigm Ubiquity training program in ET studies. Uh, and uh, we'll keep everybody uh, posted on that. Uh, so you're all welcome to the after session chat. Uh, you'll see the link in the uh, chat uh, box. You received the, the link in your Zoom invites. Uh, and then we'll see you all again tomorrow where we'll have our fourth of five sessions on whistleblowers, uh, this one from the corporate sector uh, with uh, Jody Evans, who's been traveling today in China. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.